Hi there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Better Call Paul. My name is not Paul, I'm Thais, I'm the technical evangelist at Varnish Software. And in this video series, I'm giving my colleague Paul a call and ask him a couple of technical questions regarding a Varnish-related topic. In this episode, we're going to talk about cache effectiveness beyond hits and misses, because the spectrum is way broader than just a hit or a miss. And Paul is going to explain that, and is also going to explain how to optimize that hit rate and that cache effectiveness. So let's see if Paul is available. Hey Paul, good to see you again. Hello, Tace. Nice to see you too. I felt the urge to call you again. And uh, I guess we're making a second episode of Better Call Paul then. Uh, question I have is people asking us how to check the hit rate and how to improve the effectiveness of the cache. Now, the thing is that you taught me some time ago that effectiveness of the cache goes way beyond hit and miss. There's more going on. And I'd like your opinion on that. When there is a request to varnish, there's not only hit and miss, there's also pass and the lesser known synth outcomes. And the pass outcome is when uh, the cache is bypassed and the traffic is just passed through varnish. And synth is the synthetic responses that varnish can generate. And when well, let's you break add... those down, right? So pass, bypass the cache. Why would you do that? Well, there are some resources that are inherently uh, private, which means that you can't serve it to anyone else. So that means that the data needs to go through the cache and not be stored in the cache. For example, if there's a cookie that is being set by the, um, by the server with some logging information or the session, then that needs to be private to the person receiving it. And if I remember correctly, there's also a way of bypassing the cache for the next request based on response information, like the fact that there would be private, no cache, no store, a set cookie. How does that register and how does the next request know when to bypass it based on those parameters? Yes, you can get pass um, in the other way as well, which is when the backend server is telling you that this is private and the VCL writer didn't already inform Varnish about the, this fact. And then it's important for the performance of the site to not try to um, use the cache again and again and again, but instead it will remember that this resource is not going to be cacheable probably. So we just remember that and we go straight through the cache. And this is necessary because if you don't do that, Varnish will serialize the uh, request to the backend to try to um, get a cacheable response. But when it fails again and again, that can reduce the performance for the subsequent requests. Very important note that you're making there is the aspect of serialization. So in my experience, making sure that when a set cookie happens or, or a no cache, no store, private header, a max age of zero, that in, in terms of VCL, that is setting bresp.uncacheable to true, saying that the response is uncacheable. So ironically, we're caching the decision not to cache to ensure that the next request will bypass that waiting list. But if yes, that information exactly. is not there, then you're serializing, right? So you don't yeah. have information and you're in the queue waiting for your turn because you falsely believe that the response would be cacheable. Yeah, you, so um, believe or not believe is is maybe not the the right um, the right way of putting it. The the point is that if you have intimate relationship about with between the cache and the backend server, if you know that things are going to be uncacheable, then it's better for performance in general to to configure that in VCL and tell Varnish upfront that this will not be cacheable. And then you will not have any kind of, of wait for the subsequent request for the same resource. Because in other circumstances where you think you will get a cache hit, you will wait for the response with the uh, intention to serve the same response to more than one uh, request. Hence the inherent danger of ending up on that waiting list for stuff that will never be able to be stored in the cache and being serialized one after the other, having to wait. And that's, yes. that's a no-go. We, we try to avoid that. Yeah, and there's, uh, there's more subtleties involved, of course. 
uh, if you But have, in general, yeah. we're at a point that we uh, you've made clear that hit and miss are, are, are common aspects, but there's also a pass where a hit is good, we, we'd like that, and a miss is, in most cases, a hit that doesn't happen yet, that is yet to happen, and then pass is always bypass the cash. But then you've mentioned that fourth statement, synth. Yeah, synth or synthetic re re uh, responses is, for example, when the varnish is telling the client that, oh, you were requesting this resource using HTTP, but I only want you to use HTTPS. And then you can synthesize and redirect inside of Varnish that will say, hey, go to this location instead. And then you'll get the HTTPS with the same host name and the same path as before, but you will be redirected to, to HTTPS. And that's synthetic and it happens inside of the cache and it helps for search engine optimizations and, and such things. That, that's one very good use case of synth, but if we look at it like a million miles away, Synthetic output is output that is generated by Varnish and didn't originate from the backend server that Varnish proxies to and has different use case. I think even in the built-in VCL, it's used for error reporting when like preconditions aren't met. Let's say you're using HTTP 1.1, which a lot of people still do, and you don't provide a host header, then I know that Varnish in the built-in VCL will return a 400. So it, it's a good mechanism to return whatever you want, either from an error case or from, hey, we're going to do a redirect or, or just send some output ourselves. Yeah, I my favorite way of using VCL Stints is to look at the host header and see that, no, this domain here is not either not present or just the IP address, and we don't know about that host name. So instead of bothering the backend, you can just immediately give a 404 to the client, and that usually deters quite a lot of attacks. Because if you look at a normal, uh, not very busy web server, um, then a lot of these requests that they receive are attacks. And many of these, again, are not with a host header. So you can outright just give a 404 in Varnish. And that's the most efficient way of handling these uh, malicious requests. The problem, or, or rather the challenge with synthetic output is the template you, you get started with because we have this default assumption of what the output template, which is HTML and is part of VCL synth built-in behavior, what that should look like. And it contains the guru meditation, which is also always a bit of source of humor, right? Can you explain the origins? Oh, it's, it's the Amiga, which is one of the first gaming computers. Uh, the, the most popular one was the Amiga 500. And everyone my age, born in the late 70s, we, we had one of those. And it was awesome. And it had this very cryptic error message, which was the guru meditation. But I think that the reason that we have this is mostly because it's so bad that everyone realized they need to customize it, which will make it better. And you do that in VCL synth by uh, yeah, changing the response template where all the, the variables like the, the status code and, and the actual message are interpolated. However, yeah. in VCL Backend error, which is also one of those built-in VCL subroutines, you should do the same thing when an error happens when talking to the to the backend, because that's that requires yeah. the same kind of diligence. Yes, there are there are several instances where you should do something in VCL synth to avoid sending something very cryptic or strange to the client. For example, if there's a backend failure, uh, if there's no backend that is healthy. Um, Varnish will generate a 503, which doesn't look helpful, but quite often you just want to have a different 503, which says, exactly. hey, your connection to us was, was fine, but the connection to the backend wasn't. Uh, or sometimes even you can just restart and serve something that has been cached. Uh, but that's, that's a lot of details. You have many options to do different things. We've reached a point now where we, we established these four outcomes, as you call them, hit, miss, pass, synth. I think our audience should now understand the difference between them and that when they start examining the effectiveness of the cache, that they should look beyond hit and miss. But my next question to you is, Paul, how do we help our users examine that? Do we have tooling to help them out? Yes, we have a ton of counters. 
Um, you have counters for the number of requests that has been made to Varnish. You have counters for hit, miss, pass, and synth. You also have this hit for pass counters, and you have um, something called hit for miss, which is related. But there are many counters, and you can look at these to understand how your site is performing in terms of these outcomes. Which means from a bird eye's view, you can know how many hits, misses, passes, hit for pass, hit for miss, synth, and, and give a little, a little bit of, a, of a, a view, like a sort of a macro view of what's going on. But if you want to start debugging this, like at, people want to improve their effectiveness of the cache, I would suggest, and I hope you agree with me, to use Varnish Log or Varnish NCSA to actually dive deeper and introspect individual requests to figure out what's going on. Any opinions there? Yeah, most people already have Varnish NCSA logging enabled on their servers. And uh, some people, or I hope most people, have customized the, the information that is included in this log by specifying a format string. And if you haven't done that before, you should do it now and include something called the handling, which is a special formatter that will tell you. Before you continue, Paul, can you explain what Varnish NCSA is and how it differs from Varnish log? Because I think that's a very important notion here. In Because yep. we are a cache. We sit in front of the backend server, the origin, as we call it, and we try to alleviate as much pressure as possible. Side effect of this is that the logs on the origin web server are no longer reliable. I'd, I'd say that they don't give the full picture. They are reliable, but they can only know about the cache misses or the cache the passes as well, uh, which is what Varnish generates to the backend. But Varnish has the full picture and it can log um, something which is called the NCSA format. It's an ancient format for logging requests um, from clients. And Varnish has a variant of, of the tool, which is called Varnish NCSA, while Varnish Log is much more verbose and it's more developer oriented. And it takes a lot of space to store, store all of the, the Varnish Log. So most people avoid that. And Varnish NCSA is good in that way. You said it's an ancient format, but it is, however, the format that the most common web servers like the Apaches, the Nginxes, the Lightspeeds, and all the others respect because it's uniformous and a lot of log analyzing tools use it. And if you want to keep, like you mentioned, if you want to keep it quite dense, you should stick to that format, the one-liner format, whereas Varnish Log can generate literally hundreds of lines of logs. I'm not even exaggerating here. But you mentioned something interesting that I would like you to repeat. You have this special format that you can probably append to the, the combined log format that we already have to get a, a better sense of what's going on. Uh, can you elaborate? Yeah, there's a lot of different kinds of information you can get in these, uh, these log lines, which represent uh, individual requests. And one of them is the handling, which means pass, synth, hit, or miss. But there are many other uh, things that you can extract. And you can even use VCL to get stuff into this, uh, these lines. So you can kind of, if you have a, um, a good relationship between the people writing the VCL and the people configuring the, the, the logs, which you should have, then you can get out usually enough information to understand a lot about how your cache is performing for various uh, purposes. So you have that view, first the bird's eye view of the counters, then you zoom in, you look at the individual request, you made an assessment and then you know so, or you spot certain passes that maybe shouldn't be passes. How do we go about our business to, to maybe improve that? Yeah, um, I think it's it's important to uh, to repeat an, old, an age old uh, truth. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. So what you do is that you look at your cache and you look at the, how many hits you have, how many misses you have, how many passes you have. And if you have a significant amount of passes and you believe that this is excessive, then you need to go and look at the logs, uh, at, the, at the details of the logs. Is there a pass here in an extract of the log that shouldn't be a pass, that should be a miss, and then later on a hit? In my experience, it, it, it's usually related to state, right? So let's say you get a request that gets a pass immediately. Well, then we need to look at built-in VCL, which says, is it a post or a put or a delete or a patch? Well, only gets and heads by default can be cached. Then the next step is, 
Well, are we talking about cookies or authorization headers being involved? If that's the case, we're talking about very private, individual, maybe segmented content, then we bypass by default. So then it's up to you to know which URL patterns, despite there being cookies, should remove the cookies maybe so that this content becomes cacheable. Because cookies usually imply that content is highly personalized. But as soon as a cookie is set, it gets reused upon subsequent requests. So it's up to you as a developer to, to, to mitigate that, either in your code or in VCL. And I think, in my opinion, looking at cookies, uh, and, and I think that the, the big CMSs and frameworks of this world, the WordPresses, the Magentos, the Drupals, who have these standardized VCL templates, already have a preconceived notion of you can cache this or you can't. But in an ideal world, and I'd like to hear your uh, your thoughts on this, you can control a lot with cache control headers already. So if something has a cookie, uh, well, then you should say read, uh, cache control, private, no cache, no store, and otherwise keep caching it. And then what's, yeah. what's your take on that? It's a bit more responsibility at the side of the developer, but what's your take as, as someone who is uh, tremendously experienced in the matter? <laughs> No, you, you get a cookie because some web developer decided to, to set the cookie in a previous request. And then it sticks usually for quite some time. And uh, it's the responsibility of the browser to set send this cookie back on, on each request, uh, no matter what kind of request it is. And if you in Varnish realize that this request has nothing to do with the cookie, for example, if it's a request for a, for an image, then you should remove it because the backend is not going to do anything with this information. So you just remove it in the cache and instantly it becomes safer to cache. And then the built-in VCL will happily let this thing be cached instead of doing what is called a safe default, which is simply not caching anything that has a cookie or a set cookie in the other direction. Yes, so you indeed. unset the cookie and you set to unset the authorization whenever you see that a resource should be cacheable and the backend will not use the cookie for anything. And that's one of the key messages here is while Varnish does respect the HTTP's cache control response headers and acts accordingly, as soon as that state, that cookie is set, well, sometimes all bets are off. So it requires a little bit of VCL writing to write contextual VCL to your application and ensure maybe these admin pots don't bother caching them. They're so personalized and so cookie heavy, we're going to make them bypass the cache. Or the other way around, if we see too much passes in our logs for perhaps images that have no personalization whatsoever, spot that, trim off the cookies, and go further and improve gradually. As you mentioned, I strongly believe in your statement as well. Pure, premature optimization is... is the root of all evil. So, and, and it sounds like a, a difficult uh, thing to do. Analyze cache behavior. It sounds very serious and difficult, but it doesn't need to be. You can look at the log, and you can look at uh, the, per, the, the different kinds of um, of information that you have put into the log, and, and usually you'll see a pattern. And then it comes down to to changing the VCL, and usually it's it's small change that is needed to change an entire tree of, of, um, of resources from being uh, passed to uh, cache hits. And then you can use your logging tools again to see if you fix that for the individual one. And then you can zoom out again, look at your stats and see how your hit rate improves if the pass rate drops. So I think the message to remember for our audience is there's more than hits and misses, as Paul so elaborately mentioned. There's passes and synthetic output as well. Keep that in mind. I think there is no real cost to returning synthetic output. Passes, yeah, yeah, there is yeah. a cost involved. Keep that in mind. And a miss, in general, should eventually become a hit. It's There's... the only way to get hits. You need to insert yes. those items at some point. And, and one of the things that is, is not very often mentioned in, in this context is that when you have a low hit rate and you see many misses, Maybe there are small things that can be changed to improve this. For example, if you get links from Facebook, Facebook will helpfully include this very special query parameter in, in the link that you can can inspect to see where where the uh, the request comes from uh, inside of Facebook. But it will destroy the the hit ratio uh, unless you remove that query parameter. 
same for Google Analytics query campaigns or, or campaign query string parameters, the same. So uh, long story short, there is a little bit of cleanup required. It's on a case per case basis, inspect your passes, see what goes on and try to improve. Yeah, it's, it's about taking some time to try to analyze if you can get more from your cache by looking at the logs and, uh, and looking for patterns. And you don't have to be a developer to, to look for those patterns. You can you know, get a lot of information by, by just reading and digging a bit. All right, let's keep it at that. Thank you, Paul, for your expert opinion. I'm pretty sure I'll be back soon with yet another question. So we'll have reasons to record yet another Better Call Paul. Thank you, Paul. Always appreciate spending time with you. See you next time. See you next time. Goodbye.